Hi, this is Barry, and welcome to the next edition of the Simplicity Zen podcast. If you're watching this on YouTube, if you could take a moment to like and um, subscribe to the, to the channel if you haven't, I appreciate it. It helps motivate the YouTube algorithm to share it to more people. If you're watching or listening to this on the podcast networks, you can go to um, simplicityzen.com and sign up for the mailing list. My guest today is Kogan, Kogan Charnik. He's a Soto Zen priest or Osho in the lineage of Tongan Harada Roshi. He began Zen practice in 2003 in Poland and soon after graduating from college, he went to Japan to practice Dharma in a traditional monastic context. Since then, he has been practicing at monasteries in Japan, such as Bukokuji, Sogunji, and Toshuji, where he did his priest training in, temp in the temple's monk hall, or Soto in Japanese. Additionally, he's practiced at monasteries in South Korea. He is currently serving at Enso House, a Zen hospice on Woodley Island, Washington, run by the Tahoma Zen Monastery. He is the editor of the just published book, Throw Yourself into the House of Buddha, The Life and Zen Teachings of Tongan Harada Roshi. Thank you so much for joining us today. It's a pleasure to be here with you. Great, thanks. Um, so how long have you been uh, working at the hospice? Uh, it's not the first time I'm here. It's the third time I'm here. Uh -huh. uh, this this time I think I'm here eight months about, yeah. Uh -huh. Do you uh, have any sense what your future will hold as far as practice locations? Um. You know, I, I know I'll go to certain places at certain times, like there will be a Shinzan Shiki, which is the mounted seed ceremony at Bukkokuji uh, next year. Uh -huh. So I definitely go to help with that. And uh, uh -huh. But mm, yeah, I don't have too far going plans, I would say. Yeah. Great. And that's probably by design, I imagine, to some degree. Uh, yeah. Yeah. I mean, you know, if I would definitely feel like there is a, um, it, it's like, a, you know, um, Causes and conditions coming together. I also had uh, a long COVID. Actually, I got I got COVID for the second time. First time I was pretty fine. When I got it second time, I got in a real trouble, and I was in bed for quite some months without being able to walk. All, wow. Almost, yeah. Wow. Where were and you? Where were you physically at that point? At that point, I was in Poland. Uh huh. I'm sorry to so, hear. Yeah. So, so uh, you know, part of the decision making process right now is that. I need to sleep more than eight hours, which is a luxury that you, you know, only certain places can 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 uh, give you. Um, mm -hmm. uh, so yeah, I mean, hopefully it'll get better with time. It's a year and a half already, uh, but I'm, you know, it's it's kind of plateaued. The, the recovery plateaued to some degree, but it's getting better. Mm -hmm. Thank you. What kind of remaining symptoms do you have? Just fatigue. Fatigue and uh, you know have to sleep more than usually. Yeah, but both uh, fatigue, uh, post exertional fatigue, right? Like if, if I do something physically, I get tired to work, you know, way sooner than I would ever, you know, normally. And I have to sleep longer. So bending down at the waist and running along with a wet cloth is not in the in the immediate cards. Could, could you could you, you know, like in the, the, the monasteries where they bend down with a wet cloth and then run oh, down? Okay. The Oh yeah, no. I had also I had also quite a quite a couple knee surgeries. So so. Oh wow. Especially this part is, is also difficult. But uh, but yeah, no. I mean, uh, we'll, we'll see. Who knows? Do you think the knee injuries were battle wounds from lots of zazen? Uh, I mean, I know that that was the case. Uh, uh -huh. But but there were also other factors, you know, cold and and uh, you know the. the just the conditions of living sometimes in, in Japan. Mm -hmm. So, um, so could you tell us a little bit about your book that before I want to, I want to ask you about your practice journey, but first I'd like to hear about the book you have coming out. Okay. So, uh, here it is. That's the, I'm sorry. Uh, throw yourself into the house of Buddha, the life and the teachings of Tangan Harada Roshi. Who's that? Um, is that Shambhala? Shambhala publications is correct. Um, so uh, most likely by the time people hear this interview, it'll be out. Uh -huh. uh, so yeah, I mean, it was, uh, you know, there was a, a translator of, of Tangen Roshi, you know, many decades uh, who we all kind of thought she will, um, you know, she will do the work uh, because, she, you know, she was the best person to do it. But then she passed away of cancer before Tangen Roshi passed away. So, uh, you know, this project got kind of on hold um 
and her materials were also lost, whatever she 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 worked on. So you know, at Roshi's funeral, we kind of discussed it with the current abbot there, and so we decided to just you know do something. So so the book is basically you know first half or not half maybe first uh, one fifth is is his life story in his own words, which is just pretty incredible story. I mm -hmm. you know I, I have to say. And that's why you sent me, right? That's right. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah, yeah. And then the, the rest is just, you know, uh, excerpts of his day shows, uh, just talks delivered mostly during session. But he also gave talks during the Canon Bodhisattva Day when the villagers from, from the, uh, you know, from the neighborhood were coming to, to hear him. And sometimes, you know, there was a little bit diff different flavor of his talks there. Mm -hmm. um, so I've heard some of... Uh, um... Tongue and Roshi's talks on YouTube, and there's a female translator. Is that her? That's right. That's Belinda. That's uh, she lived from early 80s in Bukokuji for some years, and she married a, a Tendai priest in in the same town, which is called Obama, mm -hmm. in in Fukui Prefecture. And she she used to come, uh, you know, whenever she could. She also had family, uh, but she used to come and and try to give some translation. There was never live translation during during session. Um, but she, she she was doing it from recording, you know, a little bit later. Mm -hmm. Cool. So um, paint a little picture of Tonga Roshi. You, you know, he's among mm -hmm. kind of people who are serious about Zen. You know, he's extremely well regarded, but maybe since there's been no books about him, maybe he's not widely known. So I'm curious, could you, just, who was Tonga Roshi? What, why is he special? What, what, um, why, why, where's the interest in having a book for him? Uh, yeah, I mean, I mean, as a sort of caveat here, you know, I'm just a kid who came at the very end of his teachings, and and there are so many generations of great practitioners, really, who are teaching themselves right now. Uh, uh, you know, like there's Hogan Yamahata Roshi in, in Australia, who has successor of his own there, or or other people. So, so I'm kind of almost the last person who should be trying to define right what what Tan yeah. Roshi who he was but i mean everybody has their personal encounter with him and um you know some subjective experience yet, yet universally i mean there was something so uh you know i don't want to sound too uh you know christian about it or something but but if, if you would you know the best descriptions if you would live with a saint like a living saint you know like whatever saint francis of assisi right or, or someone of that kind that it it's not just you know in the doxan room they have wisdom to offer or something there was just something about all his being right like if he came out to the room it was like sun coming out from the clouds it was just like you know his presence was was powerful uh his compassion was just unbelievable it was just palpable like, like the way he loved and 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 wished good for every single thing was so striking that it's truly i mean it was kind of uh just by being in his presence certain habits were just falling away because you were in awe mm -hmm. of how deeply realization can go uh, and uh and of course he was you know he was a human being like everyone uh but 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 yeah he, he was the most impressive person i ever met and uh and there was just something very, very impactful about his whole being, the way he moved, the way he talked to people, the way how kind he was, how, you know, there's there's many, uh, of course, styles of personalities, right? It's, it's all coming, not only depth of realization, but also personalities mm -hmm. is uh, coming to play and, and sort of, you know, was the vessel of it, right? And, and he... I mean, in the book, I mean, in his own words, which, you know, it's, it's kind of me me buttering here in my Polish accent, but but I mean, he had this whole phase in his youth when, when he was uh, he was inspired to be like a chair, right? He, he, that was his yeah. isu ninaru in, in Japanese, which he just wanted to be of service. Like he was maybe 16. He wanted to be of service to anyone that he could ever come in contact with without any notion for gain for himself and and he was writing in his notepad like how close he got to it and and was you know strict with himself let's say uh you know really trying to put it into practice uh 
Uh, and uh, yeah, I mean, probably, you know, many people know this story who are familiar with Tangan Roshi. Uh, uh, and he, you know, through this whole, uh, he, he had s some kind of opening, uh, which he didn't, he, he, when he asked, he was asked, he, he said it wasn't pension necessarily, but. Oh, really? Because when I read the, when I read the uh, excerpt you sent me, I mean, it definitely sounded like a little taste. Oh yeah, I mean, yeah. It, it's it's also probably the the, the levels of you know mm -hmm. wh where where do you put the bar and and you know he mm -hmm. his teacher certainly uh, you know this first session that that he attended you know the, you know probably most people would be passed on more uh, mm -hmm. with with what he experienced there but but you know his teacher kept him like not yet just you know mm -hmm. because he probably saw that this this young boy is just really on fire with 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 wanting to know and and um yeah so so i mean tangan roshi was really a truly special person and and his warmth was also you know uh, pretty exceptional like you know sometimes you meet roshis in japan and they are kind of kind of you know on a pedestal kind of above the ground Mm -hmm. uh not, not you know wouldn't get much into conversation with the, with let's say parishioners or something or you know uh but Tangan Roshi was really you know people everybody I met and it was really interesting you know for example I had few friends you know we all went to kind of Semmon Sodo training right and mm -hmm. and each person went to a different Sodo and at each Sodo um the shike which means that the kind of head of training of each monastery had a story about tangan roshi and they were you know like when they were telling it they were almost moved to tears like whenever they heard like oh you're from bukokuji and 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 you know immediately they would be like oh i i met tangan roshi when i was younger and so so for example the the soda where i went uh to toshkoji so the the shike there suzuki seido roshi he 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 told this story how he was a young monk and he was traveling uh, during Takuhatsu, right? The the, the mm. alms begging, and he came to Bukokuji uh, and asked if he could stay overnight. And and uh, you know, hearing that that there's this great master there, and Tangan Roshi showed him you know where where, where he would sleep and everything. And and uh, the, you know, after Zazen, the monk went to sleep. And uh, Tangan Roshi, or, or, or the you know the Suzuki Seido Roshi, which back then the young monk, he, he came out from the Genkan and and saw his waraji, his traveling straw sandals, which Tangan Roshi himself cleaned for him. They were muddy from from the travel and put you know nicely there. So so this you know kind of twenty five year old young monk would be able to just put them on and 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 go further with his journey. So just li little things like that, even you know everybody you talk to has some story of like that uh, either of his kindness or also you know of his of his wisdom which you know truly he I, he could be brilliant you know yes okay you know reading the you know his little expert of his life i mean he seemed to have a pretty strong bodhisattva you know you're talking about the chair you like jerry he had, seemed like from the get-go incredibly powerful bodhisattva drive you know before he really knew anything about zen at all and um yeah i mean he seemed you know he seemed pretty special and good like how much do you think of his incredible presence was just his natural being you know like the causes and conditions coming together versus his his um awakening his realization like it, do you think you could parse that out at all or is it a false dichotomy uh no, I I I, told, I think it is to some degree false dichotomy, but we can go this this route. Um, there was this there was this gentleman who uh, used to come for the Canon Bodhisattva Day talks, mm -hmm. and and you know like just through through being at Bukokuji, I, I I got to know that he was a friend from school and also through the wartime uh, of mm -hmm. Tangan Roshi. So he and he at some point he published some of his letters. Uh, and it, you know, it, it definitely when he was describing how he met Tangan Roshi uh, at first, right? He, mm -hmm. he was saying there was this beautiful angelic sort of young man standing there, and there was just you know uh, some kind of something about him that he kind of felt drawn to in in a way that you know there was some sort of uh, purity in him. So so you know, of course, it seems like 
he he had some karmic ripeness to to um, that brought this really sweet and and, and mature fruit later on. Um, but also, you know, his training was uh, life or death. Uh, you know, to say, I mean, there's no other way to say it. He was yeah. really. Um, were you there when um, Jiryu Rushman Byler studied there? Do you, do you know Jiryu? I I, know, I don't know Jiryu. He he no, he really left a couple of years after, you know uh, before I came. So yeah. So um, I don't know if you do you read his book? Um, uh, I think Two Shores Zen. I think it was yes, called. I yes I read this book. Yeah. So in the book, I mean, he states pretty bluntly that um, Tongan Roshi is the most realized. At least this is at the point of writing the book, this was his opinion, maybe feels differently now, but um, that, you know, Tongan Roshi was the most realized human being he'd ever met, like basically explicitly called him enlightened. And, and, and I, I think pretty explicitly, explicitly stated, like he may be one of the only few in Japan. And do you, I guess, in by, you know, and that would mean the world. So, so, I mean, do you feel like he had a, a deeper depth of realization than anyone you've ever met? I know that's kind of a blunt question, but I mean, that, that's what a lot of people say. So I'm kind of curious to hear your yeah. on that. I mean, I totally hear where the perspective is coming from. First of all, you know, who, who am I to be a stick to, to, to measure, you know, the greatest teachers out there? So, so I mean, and, and I don't say that. I, I just understand that people speak about their subjective experience. Mm -hmm. So I, I don't say it's 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 wrong to to you know to put something like that. That's how they felt. Um, I you know definitely yeah there is there is this sort of felt sense even you know even if I like put the incense in front in front of the altar to him like mm -hmm. I mean there's this sense still alive in my body of 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 you know so so there's definitely it was the most impactful person uh, i ever met this whole this whole you know explicitly saying enlightened i mean i you know of course we would have to make pre precise terms here because this word can mean many things but i, I honestly don't think it, it's some super rare occurrence i mean depending mm -hmm. what, what do you define as that right so uh i definitely feel like tongue and was enlightened whatever this word mean i mean I, I can guess what different people mean by this word what, what do you mean by it if you don't mind uh let's say that um clearly there was no sense of subject to experience within him mm -hmm. there was no sense of separate self left anywhere Mm -hmm. uh, there was, you know, just natural response to, to, to time, place, and circumstances, free, free functioning, right? Very mm -hmm. clear, very unobscured functioning. Uh, uh, the sort of, you know, the, 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 uh, yeah, the, 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 the just incredible bodhisattva vow and, and, and living it. I mean, you know, I, I could go on and on, but yeah. I, do you, do you think he was free of dukkha? Um, Not necessarily yeah, I mean, pain, again, but do you think you, but from what you can see subjectively, do you get a sense, because I've never met anyone in my life that I, I've worked with incredibly inspiring and incredible teachers in my life, but I've never met anyone that I felt was totally free of dukkha. And so, yeah. again, like like you said, who am I to judge? But that just seems to be mm. the evidence. And I'm curious, subjectively, living with him, did you get a sense that he had any dukkha ever? Yeah, yeah it's, it's it's again, I think the terms, it, it's, it's yeah. terms is where we trip so much in the conversation about Dharma overall. Uh, mm. You know, some people say Roshi, some people say Roshi. I mean, this might not mean the same for them. Some people mean Session, some other people mean Session. Sometimes those are very different, you know, uh, things unfolding. Same with Dukkha. I mean, if he kicked his foot on the on on something, of course he feels pain, right? Right. But um, there is no sense of anything wishing it would be different, or or and any narrative that uh, you know, them those stairs kind of, you know, I mean, it's just 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 the environment. Mm -hmm fully you know experiencing pain and 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 dissipate and disappearing right 
Mm-hmm. But I, I don't think, uh, yeah, again, it's, it's, you know, we're, everybody's human, right? Like, um, it's not that we are like a flaw, flawless, perfect person mm-hmm. right but i don't think this, i mean depending again how to define the term i i do feel like you know there there's definitely uh there's definitely levels to it for sure right and and we can there are many places where we enter into and we can we can conclude ourselves subjectively oh this must be it i mean mm-hmm. how, how can it get any more or less rather or you know whatever um, so that's, you know, that's the role of the teacher to kind of guide, to, to see that, because sometimes this assumption can be totally false. Um, so, yeah, I mean, I, again, I, I never walked in his shoes, but he seemed pretty free to me. So, mm-hmm. yeah. That's wonderful. Thank you. Um, one thing that struck me about his taste shows, or maybe they were more informal talks and not actual taste shows, but at least the translations that have made it to me over the years, is how... Um, incredibly positive and affirming and wholesome his approach to talking about practice was a lot of a lot of um teachers you know and and it's probably just different skillful means you know focus a lot on the negative aspect of delusion and how we're mired in it and so forth but he always seemed to want to talk about it from the perspective of the absolute and just the and how that filters into our subjective world is just a very wholesome, positive, beautiful manifestation of being alive. Do, do you think that's an accurate description of his approach? I mean, generally, yes. I mean, definitely he did during his talks weave in both perspectives. He, he, mm-hmm. he would say, you know, this, the, 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 this, this small separate lump of suffering you know, it gets irritated, you know, he, he, he would definitely speak of, of how is it to live life while, you know, kind of, uh, uh, you know, cherishing the, the sort of delusive idea of, of separate me. Mm-hmm. Um, but, but overall, yes, I would say that his teachings had much more, yeah, that there, there, there was a sense of him describing things as they are, and, and that was very powerful in his talks and, and 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 yeah like he 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 could speak of you know about suffering and he he himself suffered also greatly you know during yeah. the, the war time and and uh, yeah you know he, he he knew it intimately but at the same time he he had this uh way of talking that that and also it was you know that wasn't the way of talking the sort of i think i say it in a, in a preface there in the book that it might sound like like someone is just like talking about some sort of high absolute thing, but it was just his daily life when when he would enter the room to to have to have a meal, right? Like it was just like sort of glorious Buddha nature unfolding, and he was just you know like truly. I mean, the one calligraphy Kakejiku, which is kind of you know long uh, scroll that I have from him is is Hoetsu Mugen, which means Dharma joy is limitless, and 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 truly, you know, that that was the sort of um, feeling about him too. That, that yeah, there was much more affirmation, much more speaking about um, the sort of realized perspective, and and uh, I think you know it, it's it's um, it's interesting. You know, he found his way. Like he, his teacher was very strict, right? Hoshinji was uh, called the you know the demon Sodo, right? The, the, mm-hmm. the peerless demon Sodo. It's in the same uh, town, right? Pardon? Are, is there, they were in the same town, Hoshinji. And... Oh, yeah. I mean, if if you would like a, be a good pitcher, you could totally throw 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 a stone from okay. Hokokuji to Hoshinji. Yeah, uh-huh. we heard each other bells all the time, so it was uh-huh. very close, very short walk. Yeah. Mm-hmm. yeah. Um, you know Dosho Port, I imagine. Yes. Yeah, uh, I remember during my interview with him, or I think it was during my interview with him, but at least I've heard him say, you know, talk. Tongue and Roshi would walk in the room and he would just be like, Tongue would be like, he was describing Tongan's point of view, like, oh, this is just the best thing ever, just being here in this room and having breakfast and isn't this amazing? You know, apparently that's, he was saying that's kind of how Tongan seemed to approach life, you know, just delighting in kind of everything. Yeah, yeah. And, and again, you know, 
it's not like he was excited all the time, right? Yeah. There was just certain radiance that was that had mm -hmm. you know that, that had this quality of true enjoyment or, or on like the deepest level, knowing that everything is perfectly as it is. And mm -hmm. yet, you know, he sometimes if you go go, go into Doc's room uh, and and person before you would would be in a deep suffering at the, at the moment for whatever reason like sometimes you would you know uh, after doing your bows you would look up and you you would see him in tears right so mm -hmm. he, he he yeah you know he, he definitely felt deeply suffering of 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 everyone who you know was in suffering in front of him but but yeah the, the sort of, i think you know in my sense always was that his overall beingness was was this joyful you know uh joyful nothingness mm -hmm. uh, did um so correct me if i'm wrong but i've had a few people tell me that um he never passed anyone on moo <laughs> no matter how deep you went no matter how much you opened up you just right back on moo is that an accurate assessment from your knowledge so again i i was you know i don't know uh what what was happening in the early days you know whether mm -hmm. Uh, but, but overall, yeah, I mean, the, the kind of generally, uh, maybe with some exceptions, I don't know, but generally that was the thing that, you know, whatever, uh, and that was his story too, right? So when he had this, you know, real breakthrough at Mu during his first session in his life, or second, uh, he first did session at Sozen Nagasawa Roshi's uh, place. Yeah. She was a female, very prominent females and master that very little people know about, but uh uh, and then he went to Hoshinji and during his first session at Hoshinji, he had this breakthrough. And and yet, you know, uh, Soga Karadaroshi kept him on Mu for the a few years later. And then, you know, he, you know, after what, what sometimes is referred to, but again, I don't want to get bugged in terms, right? But Taigo Tete, which is the sort of thoroughgoing, mm -hmm. uh, very profound enlightenment, uh, is when. Uh, you know he 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 kind of uh, passed him and and Tangen Roshi just you know he that, that was his dharma his way he he even if you had some opening uh you know he would acknowledge it or something but he 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 would probably keep you on low yeah mm -hmm. some people did practice shikantaza at Bukokuchi, right so so right. it wasn't like um one size fit all necessarily um but yeah majority of people uh, practiced Mu and you know when I was there the head monk who, who was there for 30 years you know he, he, you could clearly hear you know you, you can hear when people present Mu in the Doksan room right so mm -hmm. so uh you know you could hear him uh, giving his best Mu um so yeah even 30 years into his practice mm -hmm. yeah. yeah um do you do you did um Tongan himself do you think he went on and did the whole curriculum with Harada Roshi definitely I mean Sogak Harada Roshi wouldn't give Inca before you know person completing the whole Shitsunai so he, he did mm -hmm. yeah mm -hmm. so this is a little bit of a tangent but it just popped in my mind so Harada Roshi he changed so he he presumably inherited a Rinzai Shitsunai Shitsu, how do you say it um Shitsunai Shitsunai yeah. and he dropped you know the book of Rinzai and um uh, uh like the what's it called the thor um thicket of thorns or whatever I forget mm -hmm. the Japanese term. And then he added, you know, the the um, Book of Serenity and the you know the lamp. Do you know anything about that? Like he came up with the with the expected or the he came up with those himself, right? That's some, entirely his inspiration to add those. Do you know anything about that historically? Uh I mean again, I don't know anything for sure, but but from what I understand, he practiced with uh at first, he practiced at Shogenji, uh, Sodo in Gifu Prefecture, this day's Gifu Prefecture. Um, and then he practiced in Nanzenji with Toyota Dokutan Roshi, who, who was a you know, Kancho of Nanzenji and later Myoshinji. So his Shitsunai that he inherited was Takuju line, um, prob you know, probably exactly what, what Toyota Dokutan Roshi was teaching. Mm -hmm. um, possibly, I don't know, you know, I know that some people do feel do kind of guess that way that he that so that character was also very very interested in spreading uh practice among lay people he, he didn't want it to be just a monastery affair mm -hmm. so part of maybe dropping the capping phrases and um 
you know, m making things slightly simpler in some way um, could be the, the fact that he wanted, you know, it to be more widely accessible practice. So is it, are you and, talking about, um, is it Toyota Roshi? Uh, so that Karada Roshi. Oh, so, so what I said that, that, that I think I think he he inherited the the Rinzai Takuju curriculum as was taught, Incl including um, the capping phrases. Yes, and I think he did adjust things to, um, you know, the way he thought were the most beneficial at the time he was teaching in the circumstances he was teaching. So that, I mean, that's my guess. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I see. Um, can you um, can you kind of paint a day in the life of a monk or a, a practitioner at um, his monastery, Bukakuji. What time do you wake up? What was practice like? You know, just like paint, like what it would be like to be on an average non session day. What's life like at that temple? Okay, so I mean, wake up would be roughly 3.40, I think. Um, the zazen would be at 4. Um, then there would be uh, 40 minutes of uh, meditation, after which there would be this uh, kind of break and, and there would be like a physical exercise. Tanya Roche was, was into, into kind of... Prior to service? Uh, prior to service. I mean, there was another zazen later and, and service. So, um, but yeah. And, and also there was, uh, for, for, for quite some years, there, there was a, they were doing a run in uh, kind of out to the town, which was asleep at that point, and then and, and, and coming back to the to the temple. And then there was like exercise, which was kind of stretching and, and kind of waking up the, the sort of body and, and the, you know, to the kind of be energetically also more awake. And then there was another zazen. Uh, after that, there was choka, the morning chanting, after which uh, different groups were, were kind of going into different directions to make a services like lay people, one monk and, and lay people would go to the Canon Bodhisattva hall and do some chanting there. Monks would run in this procession over the graveyard and, and chant on a different uh, graves to the abbot, previous abbots and, and different places. Mm -hmm. And um, after that, there would be breakfast. After breakfast, there will be Nitten Soji, so daily daily cleaning of the temple. And um, there will be a short break after that, before the Samu itself be began. And then after Samu period, there, there was some chunk of time uh, before the uh, lunch, which was at 11.30. Um, and yeah, then afternoon, there was Samu from 1.30 until 3.00. Uh, evening chanting at four, uh, dinner at five, and then from six twenty until nine, uh, za three periods of zazen. Mm -hmm. Would there be um, is during the zazen they, would they announce dokusan and people would run to the dokusan line? How did that work? No, usually it would be just sound of the bell, right? So so uh, Jisha would go with Roshi to the kaisando, and then. You know, they would be the first person to hit the bell, and as soon as the bell is hit, you know, everybody's you know j jumping up and, and running through the through the temple to Hondo to to line up in a in a line, and um, then you know, one by one, go to Doksan. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And that was during morning and evening zazen, or just one, or how did that work? So it, it varied, of course, during the you know the whole. You know, Tangan Roshi became abbot of Bukokuji in 1955, and and he uh, retired. I mean, basically, you know, he, his health was just completely ruined and gone by 2012. Mm -hmm. So he was bed bedridden since then. So in this spectrum of time, you know, there was there's different variations. Uh, uh, usually, Doksan would be, you know, when he, when Roshi was healthy, it was in evening time, one one once a day. And you know the, the the kind of more his health was kind of declining. It, it was kind of more spotty. Mm -hmm. And uh, were Doku songs with them pretty quick affairs? Pretty quick affairs, unless uh, you could ask um, to have Doksan outside of this, uh, you know, th this sort of uh, temple Doksan, let's say, and then you'd uh, you could have Doksan with him, kind of outside of this context and and it could be longer if if 
for whatever reason, you know, you, you needed to talk with him about something or, you know, whatever. Mm -hmm. you know? Um, all right. So I'd like to hear, um, oh, uh, so contrast with that session, like that schedule with the session schedule. Session, you... session. Mm -hmm. how, do you, how do you pronounce it? From session. Japan? Session, okay. Mm -hmm. Uh, so, so you are asking about the schedule during session. Yeah, like you know, um, mm -hmm. I imagine was there still was there any um, obviously a lot more zazen, but yes. was there was there any um, was there any samu or work practice or anything like that? No, no, there was not even daily cleaning of the temple. Mm -hmm. uh, there was completely nothing, uh, and you know, of course, the advice and, and overall always the advice was to to kind of you know stay with your practice so so this this was a little bit oh you know of course when russia was kind of getting older and less strict you know things things changed but overall bukokuji was this you know really uh immersive practice place where where you, you were not really encouraged to talk to anyone uh mm -hmm. it wasn't like like you know let's say that there would be tea corner where you could always pour some green tea for yourself that, that you'd be like, hey, let's have a tea together and, and you know, sit on the stairs or anything like that, right? It was, it was you know, if you want tea, you pick your tea and, and you go to some secluded spot, you drink it. And, and you know, Rosh was always saying you have to always keep shashu, right? Which is the posture of, of the kind of walking practice mudra. Mm -hmm. And um, and he himself was, you know, even, even uh, you know, such a realized teacher, but he, he lived his teaching so he really wanted to set the example and this is a story that um jisha told me who lived with him uh, when when Roshi lived at this particular building in the second floor and jisha lived the attendant lived with him and and he said that he heard some kind of you know uh noise because tanning Roshi would often work until late night uh about like office matters of the temple like mm -hmm. he, he he wouldn't want his students to be bothered with anything but practice so often he would take on himself like responsibilities that many other temples just give to other monks and so he would work to, till very late night sometimes um on on various things and and this 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 attendant kind of looked to the corridor um to see and 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 there, there was Tanya or she walking in shashu like it was literally 10 feet from his room to the toilet but but you know he, he would make shashu and, and walk to the toilet and and, and after mm -hmm. that he would come back and so, so you know, so Shashu was, you know, uh, uh, kind of a norm in some way, and he, he, uh, so so overall, like the, the, comparing to some temples, there was more free time than usually, mm -hmm. but this free time, you know, was always uh, it, it was emphasized as zazen time. So my kind of daily uh, non-session uh, practice, I was doing roughly about seven hours of zazen a day um we, together with the you know the formal what's on schedule plus the the, the mm -hmm. sort of extra settings wherever it could be fit so 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 it yeah it was it was um definitely like a um very good container uh to to kind of dive into your practice and don't worry about anything yeah. great um would um so how did so you said there's not a lot of chatting among the monks or i won't when I say monks, I'm talking about the lay or not, just the people living there. You're probably everyone's essentially living, work living as a monk, whether they're ordained or not. Um, how was the interpersonal relationships? Was there a lot of fighting? Was there a lot of tension, or did people tend to get along pretty well? We guys treated mean, roughly by the head monk. You know, each were, temple were you was the head monk treating people roughly. <laughs> No, I mean, so each each temple of four ha has seasons, right? Like like right. in whichever decade you came in, it was a little bit different feeling. Mm -hmm. uh, I I never had much problems at Bukokuji with with really anyone. Um, the, you know, I felt sangha was really great. You know, this Bukokuji sangha was the the kind of uh, officers, let's say. I mean, you know, people who run various positions were only Japanese monks, and oh, really? you know, every, yes, yeah. I mean. Yeah, it, it was it was it was just easier uh, that way. I think Tangen Roshi just you know knew that for Japanese, you know, it's easy to they, they know the language, so they can talk mm -hmm. with the parishioners. They they can pick the phone or the kitchen was was exception. Of course, kitchen was um, you know and any any a man could be pulled into the kitchen. Mm -hmm. uh, 
Um, but um, what was the question? Where, where were we heading with it? Um, good question. What was the question? <laughs> I don't remember. Oh, about the Sangha. Yeah. Okay. Oh, yeah, yeah. Um, yeah, so I, I <coughs> you know, it, it was kind of this thing that on one hand, you know, those are people I intimately know. I know exactly how they put their ball down. I know exactly how they hang their laundry. I know exactly what, you know, what, like who, who goes to, to the to toilet immediately after the meal, right? Like, you know, so mm -hmm. much people's body clocks and everything. But on the other hand, I, you know, I know much less about those monks there that I, I know about some other people from other temples, for example, because, you know, there was much more interpersonal kind of relating. And, mm -hmm. and who, I mean, who knows, maybe like in the summer, because Bukokuji didn't have any policies of, um, you know, uh, you have to apply and you cannot, uh, you know, every, anybody is welcome. If you want to practice us and if you really want to learn about, you know, this practice, you can come. So people could come for like two days. And, and I think some of the tourist office in Kyoto, Eki, Kyoto Station, they they had our name so, so you know sometimes random people would show up so of course summer was a little bit more turbulent but mm -hmm. winter because winter was so harsh right i mean there's no heating anywhere mm -hmm. there's inside and outside temperature is same and, and it's fukui prefecture which is kind of north same prefecture as aheji so kind of snowy cold prefecture um so unless you're very serious about this practice you won't you won't stay after mm -hmm. the winter it's, it's was, were there formally defined angos Yes, there was two angos, three months each. Um, uh, a little bit off from the traditional dates. Traditional dates are 15th October until 15th January. At Bukokuji, it was 1st October until, uh, you know, end of December, to to Tojitoya. Mm -hmm. And uh, and same in the spring, 1st April until end of June. How about a Rohatsu? Would you guys kick it up a notch during Rohatsu or was it already so intense there wasn't really... Yes, yeah, so, so that was the thing about Bukokuji. I would say that comparing to some temples, um, it wasn't as like trying to to go completely crazy with it. Tamganoshi, you know, he, uh, which kind of suited in a way to my body mind. That, I mean, I could really utilize his approach. He wasn't about like uh, he, he was, you know, he was about giving people uh, kind of choice in some way that like if you. If your practice is, is already boiling enough, like, you know, there's other people in the Zendo all at any time you would go to the Zendo, there would be people and not only during session, like, uh, you know, I, I, well, I many times it was I would wake up and it was 1 a.m. and I'm like, OK, I don't think I'll fall asleep. So I, went, I go to the Zendo and then there's the head monk who is there for 30 years, uh, you know, sitting in the darkness, not even turning off on the light because he doesn't want to probably just use it for him only for himself. But. But you could see, you know, you could see him sitting there. Um, so, so uh, yeah, the the the, the uh, sitting at Rohatsu was longer. I mean, there was earlier one hour earlier wake up and one hour later uh, sleep, and the last night was was until midnight. But the next morning, you know, there, there there's zazen, there's chanting, there's so, so he, he was more about like you just have to be on it all the time. Mm -hmm. And um, so there was not like a free days, like, um, you know, there are temples, uh, uh, you know, let's say Sogenji, right? Like well, after a session, you have completely free day. Like you can, you just have to show up for breakfast and then you can tell Tenzo, I, I won't be here for lunch. I won't be here for dinner. I'm out and, and I can do whatever I want. At Bukokuji, it was every day of, of, the, week, of the year. The three hours of, of, of six twenty to nine zazen would be always there. So the free, the kind of what was kind of free day about free was that the wake up was was hour later, and then but there was all all, all you know all and there was no samu. There was tea ceremony when Roshi was giving his talks uh, uh -huh. during the tea. I mean, kind of not, not not like a formal tea ceremony, right? Just serving matcha in a, in a temple way, not not like a sado way. Uh -huh. Um, did what would, would official Soto Shu monks ever come by for to practice there, or is it mostly just kind of crazy individuals burdened for awakening? Like, would you know, because you know, a lot of you know, you know, um, you couldn't go there and get your official Ongo credit, you know, towards becoming an Osho, for example. So, I'm curious, would you still anyway, would you still get some Soto Shu monks? would go practice there i mean 
almost everyone who was there, you know, as a monk, and I would say there was maybe 50% of Sangha was monastic, at least. Um, yeah. yeah, I think so. And, and you know, all of them were Sotoshu monks. Um, the Italian Roshi, you know, he, if he had some, you know, students that were at Bukokichi for a while, and he felt that maybe, you know, for the future, it's good for them in some way, he would send them to the training monastery for a year to get their license. And then and, I mean, sometimes also they could help more in the funerals, right? I mean, he, mm-hmm. it requires several monks to perform a funeral. And, mm-hmm. and of course it's, it's, it's a more, you know, like it's a more courtesy to the parishioners to have uh, people in a, in the colored robes, not, not a kind of tr- young training unsui. Mm-hmm. So he would send people mostly to Zuyoji um, for training, and then you know they came back. But yeah, all of them were Sotoshu monks, officially registered. So all uh, Japanese. You mean? Um, Who they would no, send, I, send for the to the Sotoshu Soto? Would that's right. I, that's right. I don't think from the Westerners. Uh, I, I mean, I might have been one of the very few who went for the uh, for the Sodo training. Um, this I is Toshoji. Yes, I went to Toshoji. And so you went there while Tongan was still with us. No, I mean, he. It, it was just it, it was just at the time that you know it was maybe last couple of years of his life. I think I went to Toshoji in 2016, and he died 2018. Um, yeah. Mm-hmm. And you know, also it's it's you know, uh, Sotoshu has the, has those rules, right? So if you are ordained a monk, right, you, you submit your papers that you had tokudo the ordination. Mm-hmm. If you don't do shuso uh, hosenshi, the the which you know the shuso ceremony, whatever sometimes it's called in America, like a mondo ceremony or or the um, yeah. Uh, if you don't do it for a certain number of years, your license as a monk is, is being revoked, right? So, uh, so you know, sometimes even for that reason, you, you kind of uh, have to, if, if you care to being registered as an official Soto Shu monk, you know, you would just do the Soto. Um, and Tonga, would he give people Shiho? Yes. Yeah. yeah, yeah. But not. Me. Not. Uh, not that I know of. Yeah, it's kind of you know. Um, generally, he gave multiple shiho. M- many people got shiho. Um, and, and, and people, we're probably, we might be getting a little technical with these terms. So shiho is dharma transmission in Soto Zen. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yes. And then, um, so he would give people shiho, so then they could wear the brown robes mm-hmm. and stuff like that. Yeah. They'd be a full priest. That, you know, they can be an abbot of a temple. They can. Mm-hmm. They can ordain their own disciples. They can give jukai. They can, you know, it's mm-hmm. sort of set of uh, various mm-hmm. kind of functions also. Yeah. When you did your Dharma combat ceremony, did you do the one that was kind of memorized and it's a script? Did you do that in Japan? Yeah, I mean, there's no other way, really. Yeah. Uh, th- this is the way it's being done in Japan. So that that's, I did it fully Japanese uh, style. Mm-hmm. Yeah. How is your, can you, are you fluent in Japanese? Yes. Yeah, so you could do it all just in Japanese completely. Yeah, and I mean, you know, it, it definitely was way easier for me to remember than people who don't speak Japanese and they try right. to memorize those random <laughs> syllables coming out of them and, and, and do it, you know, in a, in a situation you have to kind of mm-hmm. uh, fill the room with it, right? Um, but yeah, no, it, for me, it was, it was a little bit easier. When you were at Toshoji, did you do, um, did you do Dokusan with the teachers there? Uh, so generally speaking, is that Suzuki Roshi who's there? Toshuji? Actually, two Suzuki Roshi. Oh, there's two different Suzuki um, Roshi. Bo- bo- it's a popular name. I think it's like like you know, it's like Smith or Brown in America. Right. Um, yeah, the abbot, this kind of docho, which is the head abbot of the training monastery, was Suzuki Seido Roshi, mm-hmm. and the Seido, which is even more confusing, which is a position. It's a second monk after docho. Um, it was uh, Suzuki Hoitsu Roshi, who is the son of Suzuki Shunri Roshi. Oh, he was? I had no idea. Yeah, yeah. He he, he right. still holds position. I mean, he, you know, by now I think he's 84. So mm-hmm. I don't know if, you know, how, how much he's involved. Uh, but yeah, he, he comes to Toshoji. I had no idea that there was that connection there. Yes, yeah. He was, because he was, he was 
Tanto and then Godo at AHG. Mm -hmm. And then he he retired from that, which was you know even more involved. But then I think he was a little bit bored at Rinsoin at his home temple. He likes, he always said, I, I like to be with young people. Mm -hmm. So I think, uh, you know, as when the opportunity presented itself, he was really eager to, to kind of come over. And, and he spent maybe like a week of the month at Toshoji, although I hear that maybe just recently he became also honorific kind of abbot of uh, Chokokuji, which is the, the, Eiheiji Betsuin, which is the Tokyo branch of Eiheiji, which is a second, maybe third biggest monastery of Soto school in Japan. So it's mm -hmm. a you know big uh, position. So he's he he. I think he's just running out of how how much places he can be involved in. Uh, but... mm -hmm. Anyway, so my question was: uh, so did you do Dokusan, Dokusan oh, yeah. Toshiji? So generally speaking, Dokusan is not really practiced in Soto school these days. Mm -hmm. uh, it's, you know, I mean, you could maybe in some sodos they, they would do it once in Ango. Uh, you know, I, I doubt there's really much of it. Um, so I know someone who went to Toshoji for two mm -hmm. Angos and never had Dokusan. Yeah, I did have Dokusan there. Um, but yeah, it was, it was very, uh, you know, if you meet once for Dokusan, sure. I mean, it, if a teacher is, is uh, you know, so maybe by some chance you will receive something that will truly help your practice, right? But but overall, you know, unless unless you are in this dynamic process with a teacher, you know, if you come for docs on once and ango, um, yeah, no, it's it, the practice of docs on faded away in Soto school and. Mm -hmm. um, kind of my personal view is that it's a little bit regrettable. I mean, it's a. Kind of leaving monks in a in a sort of say it um, again. It's your personal view is what. It, 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 it's a pity. It's it's a, it's a true pity that that. Um, and, and again, I mean, I, yeah, I don't want to get too kind of hard on in this interview on Soto School, but because Ta, for example, Tang and Roshi, you know, he he would speak. Uh, he would never speak about particular teachers or anything in any negative terms ever. He he, mm -hmm. he was just doing his thing and, and that was important to him. That's why, you know, if I'm speaking about him here, it would be embarrassing to kind of uh, be too. <laughs> but he, you know, of course, his own teacher was was very vocal critic, right? So that Harada Roshi right. was, was truly, uh, you know, one of those people who are fighting for, for uh, you know, that sort of clear guidance and, 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 um, you know, the, the kind of remaining in this spirit of practice before, but yeah, these days it's, it's kind of fading away, Doksan. So, um, at Toshoji, it's very little of it. And, you know, there are some lectures, there are some Teishos, uh, too, but, uh, main thing is just living together, right? It is this sort of Sessa Takuma, which is the Japanese words for like a grinding, crushing and polishing It is right. the sort of living together and and you know of course if you do have stable practice and, and 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 you know some experience in it you can use it to wonderful way and and even maybe if you have certain type of karma which you know could be something that's really ripe you could you know just surrender to to to, to this relentless schedule and and and, and into this life and then get you know profound benefit out of it but the kind of problematic side is and i witnessed it uh, myself uh, seeing monks you know on, on the sitting platforms um and, and just re re you can see it so clearly especially with your shoes and you're facing the, the soda right mm -hmm. you're seeing that the japanese young monks who came you know to get the license to get the paper just waiting they're just waiting until this whole zazen is over and, and finally they can leave the room um so yeah it's it's, that, it's that's it's, happened I, to me okay <laughs> i wanted to leave the room <laughs> i mean all of us did at some point yeah. but, but if you spend your entire training time uh in that state you know it means you know mm -hmm. with better circumstances with a clearer guidance you, you could have totally uh you know had some profound realization and helped many people right which is the whole point of 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 mahayana buddhism mm -hmm. but but you just spend things kind of just in the dark and and, and not giving it much instruction so mm -hmm. yeah. so you uh you also studied at um, soganji with the other harada roshi too right 
That's right. I mean, Harada is, is also such a pop popular name, right? So, right? so I can think of maybe six Harada Roshis that were living within the last hundred years mm -hmm. uh, that were famous. But yeah, no, so, Shodo Harada Roshi, right? Huh. Uh, how long did you practice there? Not too long. Um, I mean, actually very short. Uh, definitely less than a year. I don't remember. Definitely more than six months, but um, somewhere in between the two. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And um, what this was this after you left uh, Bukaku, Bukokuchi? Oh yeah, yeah. It was after Tangan Roshi stopped teaching. Definitely. What was it like there? Can you compare and contrast a little bit? Yeah, <laughs> you know, um, it don't, was don't different. Watch this, so you can just speak freely. Sorry. Sorry. Yeah, it, 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 it. You know, I hope so. It it, it was different um, in many ways. Um, but you know, you also it, it it is a true practice place, right? I mean, I if someone comes to me these days and asks, hey, you know, I really feel this sort of uh, intense practice is is the way for me. Like, where should I try? I say, you know, go to Sogenji. Um, you know, it's that's your that's your um, that's your good bet. Mm -hmm. um, when I came there, you know, the, the problem was that Tangen Roshi was a, such a hard act to follow. Mm -hmm. that um you know it was a little bit uh in some ways disappointing um you know also the the atmosphere was a little bit different and and again it could have been you know uh different at different times uh, mm -hmm. at at both temples too but um there was all, there was this kind of sense a little bit more like it was a kind of like a west like, like a summer college kids camp in some ways i mean there's a lot of young people and some of them awesome people and i i i'm good friends with them until now and probably i'll get in trouble if i continue <laughs> but uh but overall there was there was a lot of chatting mm -hmm. there was a lot of um freedom in some way like the whole afternoon was always free and you could go to the town you could go to the coffee shop you could go to the gym some people are going to the gym or mm -hmm. or do your laundry in the laundromat um uh, there was more, more, more kind of interpersonal, romantic dynamics. Mm -hmm. um, there was more, um, you know, there were some, for example, parties uh, a few times a year, like like we were just really drinking. Um, so, so for 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 uh, many people, like let's say coming from the Western sort of Zen center, you know. Mm -hmm. it, it, what's wrong with that and i i myself i you know i totally relaxed but coming from ha having this real uh affinity with this traditional monastic training that bukokuji you know was much more of that flavor yeah it, it felt like you know people are chatting during samu and like hey you know i had a great movie on my laptop do you want to watch it later in the uh, and it's not that there were no people who were, you know, just not taking part and 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 sitting into the night. And sessions were really good. That's what I have to say. Sessions were really good. Um, the schedule was good. There was there was um, literally. Was... Harati, I mean, he's apparently incredibly intense in Dokusan too. He's intense. That's a good word. Yes, that yeah. he's very intense. Uh -huh. uh, he is. He, in some way, I mean, sometimes I like to compare it like this. Tangan Roshi was, was like the sun, right? Like mm -hmm. kind of golden and, and warm and, 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 and just blinding in some way. And, mm -hmm. and, and Shadow Heart Roshi was like a moon, like this eerie, like, you say eerie, moon? like the moon, like, like okay. this eerie silver light that kind of penetrates and, and kind of there's this, there's this kind of, you know, the sun's in the room is dark and, and he's mystical. just sitting there kind of hunting at you like kind of you know um yeah no he he's he he can be very intense and and, and overall his expression is kind of more of a mahakala uh sort of you know like, like an angry and angry angry dharma guardian type of type he, you know he, he's angry quite a bit mm -hmm. um yeah but but so overall yeah sessions were great um there's only 30 minutes of break after lunch nothing else Mm -hmm. uh, so, so they had Nitten Soji. So soon after Nitten Soji, uh, you were straight going to the Zendo, and then after dinner, there was this, you know the last sort of clappers uh, before dinner, and then it literally you had to run to to to, to like slurp down. Uh, it was freestyle, so some people were just sitting through it, and and they wouldn't go for food. Um, so so just go eat 
and you know you won't be able to like you know uh, forget about like brushing teeth or anything right like you, you just go back sit down and immediately the long kin hin starts in the evening sort of uh, schedule and and then there's a mandatory yaza outdoors um so uh, you know depending on roshi's mood or, or sometimes you know maybe he would lose track of time but you know you could be there until like you know 11 30 p.m or or so everybody has to be there. And, and then once he get, do Kenton with his incense, mm -hmm. uh, he goes um, to his quarters, then you can leave. And, you know, there, definitely there are some people who are staying. Beyond this is Yaza Night City you're talking about? Yes. That's right. mm -hmm. yeah. And um, what, I don't know, maybe this is an inappropriate question, but what, did you work on Moo with him or how did you, what was with your him? Yeah. No, with him, I just told him that my practice is following the breath. Mm -hmm. And it was kind of tactical maneuver on my part. Uh, you know, I just wanted to kind of, uh, you know, go back to to to, to zero mm -hmm. uh, with him. And uh, and so you know, so so that, that he, I mean, he he did sometimes throw their susoku kan, which is the counting of breath. But um, that's basically what we were looking at. Yeah. Mm -hmm. He um they they do the extended out breath, right? Yeah, very yeah. sort of like yeah. force it out with your muscles. How, how did that work for you? Uh, I didn't like I, it didn't work for me yeah it's it just yeah no I mean it, it, it it's kind of yeah I didn't find it useful yeah mm -hmm. um so a uh, little bit before we go out, I'd like to hear a little bit about your practice history to kind of put in context all this for people so you, you were born and raised in Poland right yes that's yeah good. um what what Zen did you encounter there so the first Zendo I entered was a uh, sort of lineage from Deshimaru Taisen Roshi, who was a student of Sawaki Koda Roshi. Okay. Um, but I didn't spend there much time. Uh, it, you know, it wasn't, uh, and you know, I was also really young and, and there was no teacher in this city. Um, so, you know, of course it was pioneering. I mean, like, you know, the, the practice was in Poland since I think Philip Kaplo came yeah. in 1975 he also had some polish students i think too correct yeah 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 so so that was my kind of second step um or actually first step, let, let, let's say that you know I, I went a couple of times to the zendo with the, the, the shimaru group and my brother did some sessions with them but you know they also had quite a bit of alcohol and cigarettes uh during sessions and, and or, i mean kind of daily right uh, every evening so overall it just i don't know it, it wasn't a connection and then soon after that, um, or you know, maybe a year later, uh, there was some sort of change. Some people left this sangha, and, and in the same building, which same room, same zendo, uh, some people split between uh, one group, which is the kind of Polish Buddhist mission, and second was the Kongroshi, um, Jacek Kongroshi of Solomon Oh yeah, yeah. I, 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 I lived at his monastery for like a year. I remember we exchanged some message about that when, when we first talked okay. about this. I have yeah. a horrible memory, yeah. sorry. Yeah, no, no, no worries. I mean, yeah. you talk to many people. Yeah, yeah. So so he was coming for maybe a couple of months every summer to Poland. Mm -hmm. And he used to do a month-long ango with a, with a one week of session in the middle. So I did that. And, you know, I was really, you know, I mean, just really in love with practice. So I was just... Um, you know, doing all all retreats I could find. Why Zen though? What what? If you, why didn't you go and play become a professional soccer player or something like what? What what drove you towards Zen or practice in general? Yeah, I don't know. I mean, it is interesting question. Um, with Zen, I just you know felt some resonance, and you know, is, isn't it the case? I'm curious. Like maybe you will tell me whether it was like this for you, but it's kind of sometimes like. You read books about Tang Dynasty Zen, and and you think like, oh, this is, this is it, but then you kind of enter, um, you know, the, you encounter practice, and you see like, oh, it's it's actually quite, you know, it's it has much more this either song or or even much later sort of flavor. Um, so uh, yeah, you know. Uh, I mean, I was surprised by all the the ceremony. That was mm -hmm. the, that was a big surprise for me. You know. I, yeah. Uh, and I I actually hadn't so. I hadn't read a lot of the classics yet. Like, like I just got, you know, I got some sense of there's something going on, you know, more than I'd been aware of. And um, I read a book called um, 
the Tao of Zen or the, the Tao of physics or something like that. Mm-hmm. And they and he and he mentioned how like and that's the first place I'd ever heard of Zen. And and he was saying how like I mean I realize in the future in the now this is kind of all nonsense, but like it's impossible to intellectually understand quantum physics. And he was saying it's intellectually impossible to understand koans and you know how they were kind of both getting at the same thing. So that's how I heard about Zen. And then I read three pillars of Zen. Mm-hmm. And then that's kind of that was my full extent of Zen Buddhism before I went and started practicing. Like I, I wasn't well read. Like, mm-hmm. like when I went to San Francisco Zen Center, I didn't realize there were two, two Suzuki's. I thought I was going to like DT Suzuki's monastery. Mm-hmm. You know, I was just, yeah. I just, I didn't, I wasn't well well read in Zen. I just wanted to sit. Yeah. Oh, but, I mean, I wasn't either at all. Yeah. I mean, I'm just meaning that I read some stories about you know exchange between uh rinzai and obaku right and, right. and you know Slack. this type of yeah. stuff it, it, yeah. in in like alan watts's book or something i mean there's not mm. many things translated to polish at all and i my english was so so at the time and it so, still remains so mm-hmm. but uh but yeah i mean one thing that if i got lucky about anything in life is actually dharma friends i i met this group of dharma friends um who we we're all in the same city we we're all like you know 17 18 19 um and uh we kind of just you know all started to um kind of explore practice together and you know people are in different routes a little some people are really into tai chi and but kind of you know we had some apartment two of them were renting and we were meeting sometimes there and practicing and um so, you know through this you know you kind of got into my hands different teachings and, and zen was just really clicking for me but, but kind of what's really interesting out of seven people that we were, um, uh, you know, I think five of them got ordained um, and two, two of them went to South Korea and did the traditional bhikkhu, bhikkhuni um, training uh, there. And, you know, uh, one went to Sogenji for 10 years, one went, uh, one became ordained by uh, Kwon Groshi, um, one one became ordained in this mystical uh, Christian church. Um, so, so overall, it was really interesting that you know we met in a tall end of nowhere in Poland, um, and and I thought like, oh, you know, this, this will be like this. You know, people are great. Like, and, you know, and then going to all the temples, I was like, oh, not everybody. You know, it, it's just people also come from various backgrounds and and through the path of you know suffering or, or being being. So, so yeah, it was just interesting. They kind of started with this group of people, and e- each person is is kind of um, uh, really, you know, really great uh, practitioner. Um, or you know, one got yes, the entire challenge. Very, very, yeah. I mean, you know, as much as the monastic life allows, but but yeah, mm-hmm. you know, we're, we're still very good friends. Yeah. So through them, I met practice. You know, we mutually influenced each other, and we, we you know we explored various things and. And then, you know, I, I started to go into Zen direction m- probably more than anyone else. And, and just, you know, really, oh no, there's this, I'm sorry, there's two, two, two friends that they were, they were, we met in, you were actually in the Deshimaru and then Kwong Roshi Sangha. Mm-hmm. So, so, but then, you know, practicing with Kwong Roshi, you know, I mean, he, he's a really, uh, you know, he, he's a good teacher and, and, um, but he, he has this thing, um, you know, I, I don't know how was your experience with him, but but he was kind of almost concerned about my <laughs> sort of eagerness about practice, right? He, he was like, oh, you should just sit 30 minutes a day. I, I think you're overdoing it or something, right? I, I mean, I, it's not that I, maybe in, in some other circumstances I could see how this advice could be good, but I, I didn't feel it was helpful. Mm-hmm. And I was kind of sitting, you know, three or four hours a day uh, during the college time and you know doing different retreats and it was really kind of on fire and i felt like you know i don't think because my music my training was in music right and 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 so this was something i you know i kind of knew uh even if it was completely different realm but but kind of practice was, hard. exactly you know yeah. from 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 the elementary school um uh, which one of this friend, and friends i mentioned we met there in this uh, school we, we were going like beginning at classes 8 a.m and most of the days 
we were ending classes at 7 p.m. And you're, you know, you really trained hard and it wasn't conceptual, you know, it, it was something you do. And through this process, you know, you, you really, uh, you know, you develop in some way. And of course, uh, practice is somewhat similar to that. So, so for me, I felt like, you know, where's the, you know, I, I was at a, a music conservatory uh, as, as a college. So I was thinking, so where, you know, I mean, there must be like a conservatory, like a college for, you know, for 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 practice, right? And I mean, of course, there there are monasteries in in Japan. So mm -hmm. I went around and 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 you know, there are a few people that I was kind of vaguely aware of or, or acquainted with to, to various degrees that had some experience. Uh, there are a couple of senior monks who were in Japan previously. So I went and and kind of asked around and said, uh, you know. I, you know, I really want to go and, and do this traditional monastic training. So what, what are my options? And also my, you know, my knees were not great ever. Um, and, you know, and it ended up with all the surgeries, but, um, you know, it was, so, so, so I, I was aware of my limitations too, but I was like, hey, I, you know, I really, really want to practice. And, and, and usually it was coming down to, you know, just a couple options. And, and many people are saying, you know, there's, there's this place, there's this place. And, and 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 this expression appeared a couple of times and it was but if you want to meet a person who is just like the living buddha then you should go to book kokuji and and see tangan harada roshi mm -hmm. so i you know I, uh they, you know of course they didn't have an email or so so, so I, I sent a fax and i got no reply and i said well that's not sure what to do what's the etiquette right like if you sit at the Genkan during the uh, new Azuma, you, know, you should call out again. So I, I waited a little bit and I sent another fax and, and they, you know, they came with a response saying that, that Tanaka Roshi says that I, you know, I'll, I'll be welcome and I should come. And did you, did you pretty much just dive in and live there for the next whatever, or were you going back and forth for a while? No, I mean, when I went there, I did have some surgery at some, you know, through, through this time. So I went back for surgery and, you know, in some way it was, you know, it's not that it was a good thing, but but I did uh, have this couple months of rehab in Poland um, that I really studied Japanese, like, like just, you know, it, I, I guess I have a little bit of this, you know, uh, I guess you could call it obsessive personality or, you know, I'm, I'm just good in, in, into like very singular situations. So when I was there and uh, and I was in bed. I was okay. The, 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 I, I'll use this time to really study Japanese, and I was just studying for, for you know uh, multiple hours. And you know, ser ser what's the word? Serendipity. So serendipitously is that the word? Ser Serpendipitously. Yeah, well, you missed. You made me forget it. Serpendipitously. What with one less syllable. <laughs> okay. So, so so luckily it happened that uh, in the village, the same village that my parents moved into and I, I was there for doing my, you know, after surgery recovering, mm -hmm. like literally walking distance from, from our house, there was living a Japanese uh, woman who was teaching at the city uh, uh, university Japanese language and she was a Buddhist. So uh, somehow we got connected. Uh, so, so I was studying with her and, and, so in this way, I could really, you know, uh, get 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 some hold of Japanese, which was helpful over the course of next years. Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, so everybody seems different. People seem to have kind of a different great doubt that brings them into practice. You know, some people it's like, I'm really unhappy and I want to not be unhappy. Some people, it's, um, I'm afraid to die. I need to resolve this. You know, some people it's. I just want to go figure out what, why am I here? What is truth? You know, so people kind of have different great doubt flavors. How would you describe yours at the beginning of your practice? What drove you to give up your life and essentially renounce regular human life and dedicate your life to practice? Yeah, I mean, I, I totally know what you mean by, I just have to say that, you know, monastic life is a re regular human life. It's a, uh, but, but of course it's, it's a, for it's me, pronunciation. I don't think you can deny yeah. that. You know. Okay, no, that's yeah. true. It's different in some ways, for sure. Yeah. Uh, for me, it wasn't about suffering, actually. I did some, you know, I, as everybody, I had a um, fair share, although I had very, you know, loving parents and happy childhood and mm -hmm. spending a lot of time, they were really outdoorsy, so just spending a lot of time in nature. Um, for me, I think, you know, I had some kind of maybe tastes, uh, of uh you know 
of, of kind of, let's say, freedom through experimenting with, you know, psychedelics. Mm -hmm. And, uh, and I mean, you know, those were very insignificant shifts, but still, I, you know, I felt I, I could see, I, I, you know, I could see, and maybe that's why I connected with Tangan Roshi, but because for me, it wasn't necessarily about, you know, I, I'm miserable and I need to kind of, um, there, there's some sort of joy that I kind of, you know, intuited underneath the, the, the kind of uh, confusion of the separate self uh, kind of operating system. Um, so for me, yeah, it was like, I mean, the, the, you know, at first I think it was more, I, I, I would lie if I would say that I had like this, you know, real body cheat that trying to save all beings, but early enough, and I don't remember when, I can't remember now, but, but early enough, it, it also became truly a concern of mine, like a true, you know, uh, sense that this practice is not for me, not, neither for joy nor for my personal sorrow, right? It is actually um, to help those who, who are suffering. So, it took me yeah, decades so that, that, to get there. Pardon? It took me decades to get there. <laughs> <laughs> no, I mean, anyway. Yeah. Um, so when you when you had your uh, psychedelic experiences, did you have what you would consider a no self experience, or is it more just like a connection with a greater reality? Like did like did you disappear during uh, your psychedelic experiences? Yeah, I mean, again, all of it it feels like talking about previous lifetime, right? Like it's, it's so yeah. far from here. Uh, I think probably they had taste of both. Definitely more of the sort of you know interconnectedness and, and the sort of uh, infinity of, 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 of reality in some way. But I'm, you know, of course there will be some moments of, of, uh, of no self um, in, in some peak, but you know, often it was that, you know, I tried diff, you know, like the regular usual suspects um, type of substances. And, and, you know, usually the first or second time would be actually this is people all sort of like, Oh, really? You know, for months afterwards, I, I would feel some afterglow of it. But mm -hmm. but later, every kind of next trial would be just like trying to regain something. Or or it was very clear to me that it's futile. That that it could be a po pointer for for some people. You know, I did meet multiple people in the monastic life too who had some you know some path of of in, this was involved in their kind of initial interest but soon it was clear that you know the more you do practice the the deeper you get and and the, the kind of you know uh, right. the, the the fruits are, are are multiplying and and the more you try to get to this it's kind of like chasing ghosts of of past so you know i, I think i don't know by 20 I, I think i dropped seeing that as as um you know and anything relevant um, mm -hmm. um. So two more questions, or at least two more questions. We talk, keep talking. Uh, the first is, um, so having practice in a very intense, super focused Japanese monastic environment, um, I don't know how much you've encountered Western Zen since you've kind of come out here, but what, what advice would, could you give us to Western Zen? What do you think we're, we could work on? What, what could we get better at? What are we missing? And you can be frank, it's fine. No, I mean, I, I would never dare to advise people that I never met, right? I mean, well, but I mean, um, well, don't advise anyone individually, just as an institution. And I know like Zen's all over the map in America and Europe, but you know, but what do you, what did you see in Bukakuji or Japan in general that you're not seeing here? Like maybe something that got lost in the translation a little bit, if anything, maybe the answer is nothing. Sure. I mean, it's also so personal, you know, I, I think that for some people, maybe going to places like Bukokuji or Sogenji would be just overly challenging, right? So, so also depending what is your aspiration, mm -hmm. like there are, you know, different levels of, of kind of karmic affinity, right? And, and there's nothing wrong if someone just feels that this message is, is um, you know, makes sense to them, but they, they feel like, I, I don't know. I mean, I, I guess it comes down to really the, the sort of um, 
whether your heart is truly kind of uh, wanting to, 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 to really go through with practice, right? Mm -hmm. um, if that's the case, you know, of course, uh, I, th I think it takes certain singularity about it, right? And again, I don't believe that uh, you have to go to monastery. Like I met people who are deeply realized who lived, you know, in a, in a lay life, and and but it's just it's not like something you can bargain. With. It is, it's it's not a hobby. It's not a side thing. It's mm -hmm. totally you know every moment is truly your practice place. I mean, like the the, the famous calligraphy right each step is the is the practice place um i mean truly it it, it it takes some it takes real you know um real wanting to to real commitment oh that is what i wanted to say it takes real commitment regardless of, of circumstances i met people in in a hardcore traditional asian monasteries who you know who are weight kind of making themselves comfy and Mm -hmm. however bizarre it, it it sounds that you can get comfy in a place that you you know you, you, your ears get bliss kind of chill, chill blains and and you're you know like the head monk of bukoku that the one at the time when the eye was there he didn't have fingernails left right it all they all kind of came off through the chill blains because you know he he's the chill he's, blains what is the word uh frostbites is frostbite, it, I, yeah. I don't yeah yeah, yeah. okay yeah so so yeah so so, so it, it seems like oh it's it, however you would get comfortable in this place right but and you know equally in the summer right like you have to sit in a four layers i mean there's no air conditioning there's no fans and 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 just you know the, the, this it's 100 degrees with the full humidity um so yeah it can be challenging but some you know try, human beings are amazing they're a capability to, to both you know to both uh uh break through the barriers and also kind of create comfortable barriers for ourselves um too so um i think you know regardless where people are i mean one thing i mean keeping silence during retreat <laughs> i mean I, i'm here at the you know um doing sessions at, at tahomas and monastery which is further harder where she's placed and people are talking during sessions <laughs> quite a bit um quite a bit and and it's not I, like I, i've noticed renzai places in general even Is hardcore, you know, even the, I think, you know, where there's real practice happening, they're more chatty in Sashin than Soto is. I think that's just part of the culture of Rinzai. Oh, that's, that's interesting. I mean, the only exposure I had to a pure Rinzai was uh, Sogenji and, and, and here and, and yeah. multiple places of Shoto Haraoshi in Europe too. Uh, but no, I mean, at Bukokuji, I mean, no one would say a single word. Yeah, it's I mean, a little, truly, that's a little more of a Soto thing, I think yeah 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 i mean possibly i i honestly don't see why it would be less distracting of course i can see at some point right like it, w when you're practicing and, and you're you know you have some clarity i mean all those tools are are all those kind of fingers pointing at the moon are not like as crucial right mm -hmm. but still i mean even if that's the case like you should do it for other people like you should th there are people there for first time or second time and Mm -hmm. So so anyway, um, I, I don't mean to like, uh, you know, I, I'm grateful um, to be able to practice here. So it's not, I mean, but overall, to, if you're speaking about what I kind of was sometimes surprised in the West is, yes, you know, there's more talking mm -hmm. and, um, but it's all, you know, it's, I mean, I, I do see, I mean, I, I only hear about it. It's not the case here at all, but I do see this emphasis on, um, on various things that are important like you know social justice or something but mm -hmm. if if the aim starts to be you know if, if your aim is not to go beyond all identities um mm -hmm. then you know it stops it slowly stops being zen right it stops being uh, buddha dharma and it becomes important socially engaged work but but i, th I think you know the, the balance is important um in my personal totally unimportant opinion um yeah i mean it's you know tamir Roshi would always say like the brave will find enlightenment in an instant right like he, like it, it's it, it it is true that there's a subset of people 
um, that are so on fire with 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 that, um, that, that, that you can't prevent them uh, from 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 truly receiving some fruit from this practice, right? Mm -hmm. And there's people uh, that their their affinity with dharma is not yet ripe enough, and and it feels like they, they, they you know they want the social aspect of it they want to be part of something they feel like this teaching makes sense to them but it's still it's still like adding furniture to your prison cell right mm -hmm. whereas zen is just like take the gasoline of practice and, and just set it all on fire until you're sitting under the starry sky and there's nothing mm -hmm. left right so, so so but then there's the middle uh sort of uh class like, like you know um i mean i might be the bottom one but but like myself for example that if you get the proper teaching if you if you meet um the, the guidance that, that is pointed um in this direction regardless i know there's this whole conversation about soto shikantaza where you know uh, and so forth i mean any valuable practice that the, that the teacher is able to point you to that i mean Whatever your affinity is, is wonderful. But mm. if, you know, it, unless um, we provide, you know, right guidance and right container for that, you know, th this middle band of people will most likely, you know, waste many years, uh, which otherwise, they, you know, it's unnecessary. Um, so mm. yeah. I, don't, I don't think I gave any concrete concrete uh, responses to this question but no i, I think you did yeah uh, and also i don't have much exposure to be you know to be perfectly honest um yeah i i, I did do, do one session at sonoma mountains and center already when i was you know when i was here at this hospice and oh interesting like maybe 10 years ago i visited to do it and then i have some exposure in poland right because i i, I was part of some groups um, but yeah, I'm, most of my practice life was in Asia, so that's what I know intimately. So I don't, I, I would feel out of place if I would talk about the Western practice too much. Yeah, yeah. I, th I think part of the dynamics of the West is so in Japan you have the renunciants, right? You know the monks mm -hmm. that are kind of engaged in hard pra pra hardcore practicing, and they're in the kind of the social contract is that you know they at least in modern Japan is they offer funerals to the Danka, you know, and the Danka can donate, can also donate for merit, right? And so there's like, there's that, that's kind of the economics of Zen in Japan. Do you yes. think that's fair? Very fair, yes. Yeah. It's a rice price, you know. You, you, I mean, yeah. you do services that are also meaningful and beautiful. I have, mm -hmm. I know people who, who find deep meaning in those ceremonies, chanting yeah. those, at those ceremonies, but yeah, yeah. overall it's, uh, in Japanese, it's called Soshiki Zen, which means the funeral Zen. Right. So that so that's the kind of the economic or sociological model in Japan. The model in America is, you know, there's kind of a small kind of core of the renunciant style. You know, you want to burn down the whole house type of Zen. But our Danka, or I, I won't put myself in that category, but their Danka is, are the people that are there more for like comfort and social inclusion and just a it, you know kind of touching the spiritual aspect of her life you know, so that's where so that's kind of the donka of, of american or western zen i think you know and and some people see that some people see a pretty big cohort of people going to zen centers that are not you know with a burning desire for awakening and they kind of see that as a problem but i kind of see it as like well that's just the social that's just how it's working in America, you know, that I'm glad that the renunciants are able to create that container, you know, for the more like kind of comfort zen or, you know, people, you know, kind of decorating their house the best they can, you know. Yeah. yeah and, it, and But one, one last point and then, and then I'll, yes. I'll stop. But I really do think there's enough of the renunciant zen available that if someone in the bigger group has bodhicitta, they'll find it. You know what I mean? Like, mm -hmm. it's not like it's hidden, you know? That's my opinion. I know not everyone agrees, yeah. but... Yes, and, and again, I mean, may, maybe I express myself unclearly, but I totally agree with all you said. I, and yeah. I definitely don't put it into categories. It's, it's bad, it's good, right? I mean, huh. of, of course, our affinity with... Some Dharma, people do, though. <laughs> and, I was and I'm speaking to those people, maybe. I'm soapboxing. Yeah, 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 yeah. 
evolves. But, but what, what I was mainly trying to say is that, as you say, there is those people with, with true aspiration that nothing will stop them. There are those people who who still, you know, are, are developing the, the sort of way-seeking mind. And, and, and they are, you know, they receive some clear guidance about morality and it's perfectly fine. But there's this band of middle people um, um, I mean, I, I hate to say that, but I have this monk friend who, who I practice with Korea, and, and he sometimes, it's really maybe unpolite, but he used to say it's, it's dragons, snakes, and worms. <laughs> Those, you know, very, very sort of, you know, maybe vulgar and, and kind of overly. Um, mm -hmm. Anyway, but, 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 but he was saying that, you know, that there's this mid, mid, mid section where, where, where important is that people when they when they look for it are able to find clear teachings because the problem is and it's not the problem only in in the west or only in this subset of of traditions or something but generally there's this problem which is you know it's natural way how things go that you know unless you are a true uh you know true practitioner and Mozart of, of spirituality, usually, I mean, you will go as far as, as your teacher can guide you to, mm -hmm. uh, I mean, not necessarily, but, but, but still, if the teacher themselves, right, doesn't have, you know, clarity and, and is providing the teaching that actually, you know, undermines the whole uh, realization project, uh, undermines the, 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 the um, uh, end of suffering project, right? There's this whole narrative, if they feel like, oh, I didn't experience ever disappearing of the subject of experience right I, I, so maybe this whole no self maybe this whole um non-duality or something maybe it's like like a poetic expressions that dogen put there right or like maybe but when dogen says you know to carry forth the self to verify ten thousand things this is illusion when ten thousand things things come forth and, re and verify themselves this is this is realization right mm -hmm. i mean this is literal expression I mean, you know, it, 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 it's speaking about living experience and those, you know, if, if you if you never had this experience, you might just conclude that Doen is just like this wacky poet, right? And, 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 and what does it mean? We don't know, but we hold this phrase as a sort of, so we sit with it. So, so I mean, again, I mean, I just, not, not to be too negative but but oh, accepting samsara is not not realizing the unity of, that samsara is nirvana right i mean yeah. so 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 it's important that that we do uh seek teachers that uh, are able to provide the guidance that that truly brings the fruit of the practice mm -hmm. and 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 of course what you said about danka and and, and everything you no know, that, that's perfectly fine and we I mean, we owe all the gratitude to all people who support our practice. I mean, that's, I mean, the, 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 the traditional saying is, right, like one grain of rice offered by a faithful donor is as heavy as Sumeru Mountain. Unless you realize the way and repay this debt, you will you will be reborn as a cow in the field, right? Mm -hmm. um, so, no, I mean, truly every support is is wonderful and, and, and hopefully we'll be able to, I mean, true teachers will be able to um, give a guidance on any level to lead to lead people you know the the again traditional expression the, the going upwards always searching body and, and heading and reaching downwards to to help transform living beings mm -hmm. um so yeah i mean i mean dogen of course dropped body and mind i mean there's that's, that's not a secret no, I mean it's, it's very much in his tradition. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I was agreeing with you the the importance of awakening. Yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. Uh, actually, so I lied. I actually have two more questions. So, um, and then I'll let you go. But one is uh, real briefly: how different is Zen in Korea that you practice there? Oh, yeah, it's it's quite different, and and that was an interesting experience for me because then you can see, you know, it's a Zen tradition with the same roots, and you can see. Koreans would would be saying about Japanese and oh this is not Zen this is I mean not all of them but there are a complicated history between you know uh, Japan was occupying Korea and you know some some of them tend to have a little bit not the best uh, feeling about the Japanese um, overall so 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 they would say like oh it's it's just military culture 
mm-hmm. and, you know, so, so like during Kinhin, the, the, the monks would, 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 you know, would wave their hands, like, you know, they would just walk mm-hmm. kind of, even the body language, it's so interesting, you know, after, I mean, I, I practiced maybe for four years altogether in Korea. So, so I, I even notice myself when I get off, let's say the airplane in Seoul, like, like you know, in, in a Korean robes, like I can see already my body language starts to adjust to how, how Korean monastic culture is, right? Mm-hmm. So there is, there is, it's a different, very different um, style. And, and they, they, they have those 90 day sessions that they do twice a year. Traditionally, it was more, you know, I mean, it was the case in Japan before too, right? This summer retreat was the thing. And, and uh, in Korea, similarly, um, they just added second retreat. Uh, so there are two 90 day periods and then you have 90 day uh, in, in between. And, and the session is, uh, the schedule is pretty much like session. Just the, the intensity is a little bit different, right? It's it's um, softer. It's, it's softer, and also it's like in, in Japan, it almost feels like they want to make it as hard as possible, right? I mean, maybe maybe you know, not every place, but but overall, it's like it's cold. There's not enough food. Uh, the kiosk will fly at you, and and you know if you you know if you nod or anything, like immediately there's someone there to kind of uh, use kiosaku. There's uh, you cannot go out of the gate of the temple. Um, uh, I mean, the, the, depending on the monastery also. But but overall, it's kind of this pressure cooker, real and continuous, right? Like you know, even if the ango finishes, like um, it, it's 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 you know at Bukokuji when you after ceremony at the end of session there are people going to cemetery and, and immediately you know going to continue their sitting and the next day and, and so forth right so there's continuous thing and in korea the idea is okay let's make it as comfortable as possible there's a floor heating in every zen hall uh mm-hmm. there's a tea room where you can go i mean these days of course i mean korea was uh the tradition was also, you know, pretty poor 50 years ago, right? But right now, if you go to a tea room in a Korean Zen hall, you have like bag of walnuts, bag of macadamia nuts, bag of pine nuts, bag of, you know, yeah. cookies, coffee from Colombia, any type of tea you can dream of, mangoes, durians, you know, it's, I mean, not every temple, but it's pretty much like that. Mm-hmm. So you have really comfortable situation, but then, you know, they sit 90 day you know, um, eight, 10, 12, 14 hours, depending on the Zen hole that you choose. I mean, you, you can go into really those that sit pretty hard. Do you think there's a, a vibrant culture of awakening in Japan and current in contemporary Korea? I mean, are there, do you, are, do you think there's awakened teachers there? Just to be blunt, are there a lot, you know? A- again, I mean, depending where you put the bar of awakening, right? I mean, it's a, it's a, uh, overall, I mean, there, there are definitely some, there are a couple Zen masters that everybody agrees that, you know, they're, they're uh, true Zen masters. Mm-hmm. Then there's a generation of maybe, you know, handful teachers that people do respect and go to practice. But, you know, some some people wouldn't be into them, you know. So the, overall, the, the, the Korean, there's a living monastic culture and a living practice culture. The problem there is too uh, that they don't have much guidance from teachers. They don't have doksan too. Um, yeah. They can, yeah, they don't do doksan. I, I mean, you can go to a big sort of kunsunim, the, the big teacher, uh, maybe before the retreat starts or after retreat finishes. But many people just follow their ideas about practice and. It's kind of, you know, sometimes you see people just reading books about, you know, vipassana and, and sitting in the Zen hall, those retreats, you know, not, not exploring what, what their own teachers could offer potentially or not. So Interesting. it's a beautiful culture. I mean, there's definitely monastic culture. It's not like the post Meiji changes in Japan were, were uh, certainly, you know, very, very impactful right and, and in korea you know you like every temple the abbot changes three years so it's not like your private business or private family temple right it's of course there are clans of 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 priests and clans of, yeah so there are kind of main main temples and then they you know the temples remain in their control in some way but there are new abbots and you go to a temple and you say hey i want to sleep here tonight is it okay and and they're like hey yeah you know this it's more like we are all sangha, we are together in it. In Japan, it's like, okay, I, I'm a student of this Roshi. 
and and I know nothing about anything else. And you know, I personally found value in that. In uh, Korea, it's more like you can sit in a different Zen hall every uh, season, and mm. people do. People change like, oh, summer, summer is too hot, so I go to this real high mountain Zen hall. <laughs> And it's cooler there. And then in the winter, I'll go to the southern, you know. But of course, it's not everybody follows just their um, preference. Some people follow where they feel the strong practice is. And, and there are definitely those wild mountain tiger monks, you know, just, you know, uh, Koreans are more wild a little bit. It's like, you know, passionate people and also mountain people. And and uh, they, they, they have a little bit more of this style of, of like a Dharma combat too. They, they like, you know, mm-hmm. so depending on the, on the, on the, they kind of test each other sometimes um yeah it's it's a beautiful culture i just personally didn't feel as much connection i didn't find any teacher there mm-hmm. i did there at some at the point in my practice that actually you know uh i, I just wanted to kind of immerse myself in in in, in just sitting um and i definitely found that you know there was plenty of you know i, I did maybe i don't know eight uh seven or eight those those 90 day sessions um but but all but yeah some i didn't feel like it's it's a place i would stay um i, I wouldn't change my base as a as a, as a tra- completely tradition you know? mm-hmm. Interesting. uh what you made me uh, wonder what kind of sitting do you do these days are you are you sitting with moo are you counting your breaths or what like when you go no. to the later day what what technique or are you just kind of well, just sitting yeah, I mean, mostly these days, probably the closest thing that you would say would be Shikantaza. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, it's just after you know certain shifts, it's yeah, I mean, just you know, pushing doors that are open in some way didn't you know necessarily feel like, but there are definitely some clarification, further clarifications. Um, I, I also found useful some, some like Mahamudra, you know, practices and and did, did retreats with uh. Yeah, I mean, I, I definitely explored things a little bit outside. You know, in some way, the affinity with teacher is also important, I feel. Mm-hmm. And um, in Japan, I didn't find anyone after Tangen Roshi that I would really connect with in the same way. Uh, and, you know, as, as I mean, I, I, I wrote an article about it before, um, but, there, you know, the Zen is kind of dying out in Japan, too. So it's not like, we, you know, let's say when I was going to Japan, I could you know tell someone about like 15 temples where, where where they could try and 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 find find a community and a practice um and now unless someone speaks japanese and and has really good knees and is and is willing to enter you know uh sometimes tough situations i mean that, that's something that i absolutely absolutely feel like it's it's uh pitiful that, that there's bullying in 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 uh, Japanese monasteries, sometimes there's this, you know, there's sometimes a little bit of violence, sometimes not even a little bit. Um, so, yeah, I mean, unfortunately, that's a little bit of this culture of like kind of army culture that, that, you know, there's this generation of guys who, men who, who are doing it to each other, because uh, mm-hmm. the karma is kind of repeating. I, I totally, you know, that, that was absolutely not the case at Bukokuji, but even so at- far. Even at anti G, you need to speak Japanese, right? You can't go there as an English speaker, I think. Oh, at anti G, I don't know. I mean, the, the, I think so. Was, actually, there were changes there. I mean, they they asked people to have some uh, some basic uh, Japanese, but I mean, since the new abbess came, I I don't know. What's, I mean, there, there's I, I don't I, I don't know. I mean, anti G is a little bit. Uh, it wasn't never on my radar. I wasn't interested in going there necessarily, but. Um, but yeah, I think they might require, and I think at some point they had requirement you can't be over forty because, yeah, you know they, yeah, they, they have to work, work so hard. Uh, yeah, so that's the trade off they made for moving out to the mountains and not having any danka. Yeah. Um, but yeah. Cool. All right. Um, so one last thing that I have is that was weird. Um, well, a question I have is, um, can you just tell a story of Tonga Roshi like? You know, an anecdote from his life, or maybe an interaction you had with him that just you think would just be really interesting for people to hear. I know this is kind of throwing you on the spot, but yeah, no, I mean, 
it, you know, on one hand, because I, I am so, so aware that how I would say it wouldn't be at all good, but I'm also not a good like a narrator or reader. But um, this, uh, I mean, the, the first six chapters of the book um, are his life story in his own words. And there's, you know, there's so many things, right? Like, I mean, it, it all begins, like I came to this world with the great depth. My mother gave her own life in order to give me birth. She already had three children. And when I was, when she was pregnant with me, she was diagnosed with stomach cancer. These around her, my father as well, tried to persuade her to do the stomach surgery that would save her life, but she stood firm, vowing, this baby in my belly is going to be born. So then she, you know, she, she was born on the day that uh, Bodhisattva Jizo is um, uh, worshipped, uh, 24th of August. Um, and and so, I mean, I, I, I know that some people in Japan were saying that he's an incarnation of Jizo Bodhisattva. Um, you know, so some people had this sort of devotional mind towards him, and and this this whole uh, thing he 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 says here. Uh, when I was still very young, when I came to understand what my mother had done for me, I wrote on a piece of paper, "My mother laid down her life for me. What does she mean for me to do with this gift?" Right. So he was he was always having this sense of like, you know, he he, he you know he's running on borrowed borrowed uh right like there's there, there's this great sacrifice that was made for him mm -hmm. and and he had this continuous sense of like how can he be of use for others and then he was had this natural inquiry mind um that you know that continuously drove him like he was always kind of sensing that something is you know that there's some other perspective available and um, then he, then he, uh, as we spoke, he, he took this practice of be like chair, right? I mean, he he was, as he writes there somewhere, he says like one time I was so, you know, strict with myself that I knocked my own jaw out of place. Yeah, I, I, I couldn't tell if that was a figure of speech or literally. No, he literally meant that. Yeah. Okay. Because because he said I couldn't stand being selfish. I couldn't stand that I would think ill of others. Like, you know, this sort of greed anger and ignorance you know crept in as as we all gr grow up right we develop those those capacities and and referring to me 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 right and uh he, he had this sense that you know there's something wrong with that perspective and then he was trying to um trying to kind of fight with it um and then so so then he had this 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 opening experience at the at the uh, Jukoku Pass, which is in Atami, um, this kind of mountain, and he had this um, real taste of, of 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 freedom there. And and since then, he he even more he was like, my life is only about repaying gratitude to others, nothing else. Like this is this is what the whole meaning is. And here is the sort of uh, you know the the, the 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 punch in his whole story is that. Um, the school that he was in, the boarding school, was Koa Sen Mongakko, which was a kind of very progressive boarding school. But at the same time, you know, it was built up to war. Like, like you know, Japan was already in Manchuria, and 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 there was a lot of propaganda, uh, military propaganda being told everywhere, and and also in the schools, you know, everybody was told what they were told. So then, when the Second World War broke, um, he, uh, you know, there was this constant. Kind of sentiment that the you know the picture of America was like like Hitler, Nazi Germany right like they, they thought there's this evil empire that took over Hawaii took over Philippines took over you know like and it's and it's not Buddhist and it's trying and, and you it's know everybody will be us. pardon and it's coming for us and it's coming for us and everybody will be tortured and and they are like real just demons themselves so so when they he saw ads in his school for a, a, a kind of um, recruitment for for the special forces kamikaze which is the suicide missions he he signed up he said i i want to protect i want to give my life to protect others he said that, that this was my intention and of course later on you know he 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 spoke often you know how mistaken this view was that, that in any sense that there's an enemy there's there's other 
is completely um, seen through in his practice, but but he went on to train as a kamikaze pilot. And then um, 15th August 1945, they were moved to Manchuria and, and they were uh, in Dalian airport um, on the peninsula. They were supposed to fly out uh, and aim at the air, aircraft carriers to, to sink with one one their airplane, they would sink, you know, hundreds of airplanes of of, of the US Navy. So 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 you know he was supposed to go, but he was the youngest in the in the whole squadron. So they were um the commander were telling you wait, you will go at the end, you're the youngest. And and the guys were flying one after the other, and you know, and you, he could hear explosions in the distance. And and time after you know time after time he would come and say you know I want to give my life you know please let me go before others and 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 he was like no no you you should wait and then literally when he was just you know about to to get into his airplane and fly and away they already uh, they already had given him the ceremonial sake that's right yeah the the kind of last toast I mean you know all all of it of course uh, from our you know from from this perspective but but overall i mean he, he was always saying i just wanted to give my life to protect others and my life of service was you know the whole be like a chair thing you know that was you know he he was prone to get hooked on 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 those on this recruitment for for this particular especially mission mm -hmm. and and just when he was you know getting to the airplane the the, the, the voice of the emperor uh, came on the radio and said this is this is the end of the war and um you know, we, we should we should just completely you know uh, surrender unconditionally. So this was you know this this huge. That was the the great question. Uh, just and, and knowing how, you know the, his friends gave life for nothing, and later you know maybe understanding also the slightly the, the kind of more history. You know, like when when American forces came to Japan to kind of. The the, the 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 militarize them you know there are whole villages of women who committed suicide jumping from the cliffs right because they thought like who is coming is just literally you know the the, the real demons the, the, just the, this is the end for them um so um you know it, it turned out that wasn't exactly the case right so uh all of the you know he, he had this huge huge question when he when was able to come back to Japan and then, you know, he's, uh, uh, you know, uh, luckily he had this affinity that he, someone told him about Sozen Nagasawa Roshi again. Mm -hmm. It's an important name that little people know. This is the, the, the female Zen master who was truly a great teacher. Was she one of Harada Roshi's Dharma heirs? Yes, she was. And she also played a big role in uh, nuns in Soto school. Uh, getting permission to give Shiho because nuns couldn't give Dharma transmission. They could receive it, but they couldn't give it. Um, so she was her and Kojima Kendo, or she two nuns. Um, they, they took, uh, they were kind of central people to change that. And it, only in the fifties it, it, it changed. So Tangen or she met her and then she sent him to Hoshinji and, and his training and, 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 and um, it, it's, you know, it's all described here. Um, but yeah, I mean, I don't know if, if that is a kind of enough to to uh, to to as a snippet of his uh, like a story yeah. of, from his life. But but also, I mean, if I can tell, he definitely. I mean, just 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 when people you know people were around him in the temple, like you know, everybody had some story, right? Like when 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 um. Um, you know, uh, when there was like a little kitten the, in the temples, there were always, you know, some little kittens uh, here and there. And we, we would never buy any food for for my, uh, ourselves. Like even if there, there was no like tofu, I mean, tofu was a couple of times a month maybe, but we would never buy food. But then, but then sometimes people would buy food for cats. Um, but, but then, so there was this little kitten that sat at the, his cushion during chanting. And usually there's the procession, right? The shuto, like you go in, uh, the, the teacher goes and, and 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 kind of enters the hall. And then, you know, there's a place in Hondo in the chanting hall where teacher sits in front of the altar. Mm -hmm. And Tanya Roshi would just come and, and, and see this little kid. And, 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 and you know, he, he wouldn't let anyone chase it away. He would just put his zagu on the bare floor and let the kitten sit on his kind of soft mat and he would just kneel kneel completely on the you know tatami uh for all chanting or or, or you know like he would uh 
you know, if a girl from a neighborhood would come and say like, you know, my, 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 my rabbit died, like, could you, could you do funeral for him? And he was like, yes, of course. You know, and just putting this the, the golden robes and, and going to the cemetery and, 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 and literally this, 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 this uh, rabbit had the funeral like an emperor. I mean, I mean, you know, I mean, the, the sense and rush would standard like Shoji Funi, which was like the uh, life and death are not two. And, and, you know, he would just, you know, it, it was just marvelous to, to see this kind of rabbit have such a, such a farewell and such a, you know, auspicious affinity. Um, so, so yeah, so, so also, you know, like when, when this whole story, when you kind of, of course, I butchered it completely, but um, when, when you kind of know his story and, and kind of, if you knew, it, knew him, it was like, oh, of course, this kind of person would have this type of story. I mean, he, he like, like, like it, it was clear, uh, it was something was very clear. Um, he, his, his sort of life was just was truly just bodhisattva vow and, and, and living for others. Um, so, I yeah. Think, I, think it's inter- I think it's interesting that it's not surprising that he took to Zen so powerfully because I mean, he was literally willing to die hmm. for others. And he just transferred that to Zen and died for others, you know, in Zen, you know. Yeah, I mean, he, he sometimes said like, I something died during the war and, and you know, uh, it just was finished in a Zen training. Um, mm. Yeah, yeah. And then and again, again, it's, you know, the whole kamikaze and Japanese army, it feels like, you know, like someone could be, you know, so kind of like intense or, you know, like you, you could imagine him being like a Bodhidharma who mm-hmm. was just, you know, like either cut off your arm and or don't speak to me kind of person. But but there was, you know, surprisingly, there, there was this boundless warmth and, and compassion. And, and, you know, when he needed to correct someone, he, there was no, there was no, no doubt when you kind of made some mistake that you shouldn't attempt to do. Um, but, but at the same time, uh, you know, uh, I don't know. Yeah, there, there, was, there, there was this profound sense of, 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 of being enveloped in, in, this, in this truly kind of benign Buddha mind that was mm-hmm. just, you know, yeah. It, it's, it, I mean, you know, don't listen to me. If you made it so far in this too long interview, mm-hmm. <laughs> why, why don't you? Uh, you know, really just get the book and um, you know re- read his words okay well thank you so much really appreciate it yeah it was great to talk, meet you and, and talk yeah. in per- kind of in person right? yeah yeah it feels like it's in person yeah okay cool well it's, i'd like to stay in touch thank you okay likewise right.